new series of three lectures by uh, Dr. Jan Shaluba, and he is the foremost expert in recombination physics uh, in the world. In fact, the uh, most precise calculations of recombination are coming from his code, and he spent uh, many years understanding the fine details of the recombination physics. I think he's the best person to uh, give you this uh, lecture, and you should feel very privileged. And with that, I think uh, I invite him to start his lecture. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Rishi. I think everybody can hear me, yes. Um, yeah, th first of all, thanks a lot for having me here. I'm really, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, um, present these lectures on recombination physics. And I think the best person to really lecture about this would be Rashid, but I have him as my backup uh, plan in case I screw up. So that's great. Um, I've been working on recombination uh, during my postdoc uh, with Rashid um, at MPA and then also at CETA. Um, and solving this problem was, was quite, quite some uh, years of investment. And I think uh, what, uh, one of the goals of my lecture is uh, to give you a little bit of, the, uh, of a feeling for what kind of physics goes into it. And I think it's very rich physics and all very standard physics as well. So I think, uh, I hope that this will be something you enjoy. So here's my theoretical model of the lectures, uh, meaning I'm going to start with an introduction to recombination physics, in particular focusing on standard recombination physics, and uh, uh, try to express why this is so highly relevant. And then tomorrow, uh, in my second lecture, I will uh, talk about the cosmological recombination radiation, which is one signal that uh, one could also maybe be looking for from this recombination era. And uh, we'll talk about non-standard recombination uh, models, as well as give a brief overview of recombination codes. And then in my third lecture, uh, if everything goes well, um, I will try to actually give you a kind of tutorial uh, looking at, at the recombination codes, in particular focusing on RecFast++, because that's a very simple code to use and very easy to modify. And I will send you a link as well to download, and you can then install. It should be very easy, just uh, if you have uh, C++ compilers, it should be easy to do. So we will do that in the third lecture. And uh, I've been told that in theory I should also have 55 minutes, but in practice I think I can take the whole break as well. So uh, let's go and get started. Right, so uh, I think you have probably seen a picture like this about the history of the universe, uh, where things uh, we uh, think of uh, things starting with the Big Bang and the inflation area, um, where these quantum fluctuations uh, are blown up to macroscopic scales, and then as the universe expands and cools down, uh, we uh, we are going and entering to this uh, into this recombination era. Of course, there's things like BBN and uh, uh, and of course uh, creation of particles, reheating, and so on is happening. We're not talking about that. We're, talking, we're going to talk mainly about the recombination era. And then, of course, at late times, there's all the interesting things happening with galaxy formation, structure formation, and so on. But you heard about that. Uh, so, of course, cosmology is about the big questions, trying to understand what is the universe made of, uh, what are the initial conditions, and, and all these interesting things. And I think it's very clear to say that the cosmic microwave background is one of the key sources of information we have about the universe we live in. Right. By looking at the statistics of these fluctuations in the temperature in different directions of the sky, uh, temperature fluctuations, so Rishi was already explaining, everything is really the same B, is just we think of it as black body spectra in different directions. And by looking at the statistics and compressing this information in these beautiful maps that, for example, Planck has been uh, producing of the temperature, uh, compressing them into these power spectra, we can learn a lot about the cosmology we live in. Right? The parameters of the cosmology, and uh, uh, we, we have uh, really obtained a lot of information and this standard picture of cosmology, uh, where we are talking usually about six standard parameters, although uh, it, it should be in addition, one should talk about the uh, cosmic background temperature as well, because it has been measured very well with Kobe virus, but usually people don't mention it, I think it's, it's uh, noteworthy. Here's a list of these parameters, and you probably have seen these. I don't want to look at these numbers at all. It's just to show you that we really uh, know key parameters like the baryon density, dark matter density, um, and, and optical depth, and all these things that define the power spectra. We know them with very high precision nowadays, percent level precision. And we believe that things started with some uh, adiabatic fluctuations, possibly set up by inflation or some early universe model. As, as you heard, and uh, we have cold dark matter in our universe, we have lambda in our universe, the accelerated expansion at late times. We put in a BBN scenario, and we also put in a recombination scenario, which is defining uh, really how uh, we can um, uh, basically calculate these uh, CMB anisotropies. So, uh, 
the same Vienna the choppies, uh, the inflation uh, error creates these initial conditions, and during last scattering at this recombination error, that's where you uh, where these anisotropies, which were set and evolved since inflation, um, uh, these anisotropies become visible to us, and we can look at them and really learn uh, about the CMB, uh, about the cosmology. And then, of, of course, there's lots of interesting things happening at late times as well, and I think you have heard a little bit of it, about it. And of course, one of them is the sunyev selvage effect, for example. Um, so. Recombination, uh, what are we talking about? Here's a sketch of the ionization history as a function of redshift. And it's the ionization fraction that I'm looking at. So the free number of electrons, free number density of electrons, uh, divided by the hydrogen uh, number of hydrogen nuclei. So it's not important if they are neutral or if they are ionized. It's just the total number, basically, of protons in the universe, if you will. Uh, whereas where, of course, you, you distinguish between hydrogen and helium. So protons and helium, they are not counted here. And uh, if, you, uh, if you just plot this as a function of redshift, then as you understand, at very early times, the universe is extremely hot and dense, and you are uh, in the fully ionized state. So at very high redshifts, you have the fully ionized uh, state, and the number of uh, the, the fraction, um, the free electron fraction, is actually 1.16. So there's two helium uh, electrons, and helium has roughly an abundance of 8%. That means uh, the helium fraction, because it's compared to the hydrogen, should of course be 16% uh, higher than unity. Then as the universe expands and cools down, uh, you get the recombination of, uh, of uh, singly ionized helium, here roughly at redshift of 6,000. That's where everything happens. Uh, so one of the electrons of the helium is captured. Then, at redshift 2,000, roughly, you're having the recombination of, uh, of, of neutral helium, so the last helium, the, the second helium uh, electron is captured. And uh, then this ends, the recombination process ends with the recombination of hydrogen, uh, let's say, a ballpark of around one, uh, redshift 1,000. And then you enter this phase of the Dark Ages, and there's not much happening there. Uh, of course, structures start forming, uh, uh, slowly forming, but then only at you know, redshift of below 10, probably like 6, between 6 and 10. Here I used a value uh, of order uh, 10 um, for reionization. Then the first stars and uh, sources appear, and they reionize the universe. So they basically revert this recombination process. Uh, you're going to hear about re uh, reionization much more, but we're really going to focus about, uh, on, on the recombination era. So redshift 1,000 and above. So uh, where does this recombination process enter? Uh, here, I just wanted to give you a very simple sketch of how we derive parameters. So we look at these beautiful maps. Well, obviously, uh, you know, there's lots of foregrounds, and you have to do a lot of things. But then when, once you tease out these temperature fluctuations, and here is some indication for the polarization, this is the uh, W map, uh, old map from W map, if you will. Then, by compressing the information into, into these spherical harmonic co coefficients and deriving an estimate for the power spectra, we can compare with the theoretical um, um, calculations of the power spectra, and in that way, derive, it, together with other parameters, uh, with other cosmological probes like Lasker structure, Lyman alpha, and, and lensing, and so on, we can, and supernova in particular, we can derive uh, the cosmological parameters which we are uh, all so excited about. And in the whole process, the recombination history enters in the calculation of these theoretical power spectra. So when you run your Boltzmann code, like CAMP or CLASS, or if you, if you are using even uh, CMB fast or something, uh, then you're put, putting in an ionization history, as I was plot, uh, showing you, and that defines how these power spectra look. Yeah? I will go into that again. So again here, oops. I feel like this is a little bit, uh, my voice is a little bit too loud, so, uh, well. Um, so here's again the sketch of the ionization history, and uh, in particular the visibility function. I think you haven't heard about it, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to very briefly sketch how this works. So the free electron fraction, this ionization history, defines the visibility function. And, and here's the uh, expression for the visibility function. It's basically nothing else than the conformal time derivative of the optical depth, Thomson optical depth, uh, um, multiplied by the, by the exponent, uh, negative exponent of the optical depth. So it defines the probability when a photon last scattered. So the last scattering maximum of this visibility function is around 1,100. That's uh, the largest probability that a photon has, has last scattered there. And before that, it's scattered probably many, many times. And afterwards, it can free stream. 
Yeah? So recombination process defines the decoupling of photons and bions and the last scattering surface. The shape of this last scattering surface defines how these modes, which Rishi was talking about, all these waves, how they are superimposing and defining then the power spectrum. Yeah? So it makes a big difference if you assume recombination uh, happens instantaneously, because then it's one phase uh, snapshot, but when you have a width of the visibility, meaning you have a, a duration of recombination, you're averaging a certain fa uh, several phases of these modes. So uh, uh, one thing that I want to point out, because uh, it's interesting, recombination is not, or the visibility function, is not peaking where uh, recombination, where the recombination history is basically one half. So the free electron fraction is one half. But it's rather peaking at redshift 1100, uh, where, where the free electron fraction is actually only something like 16%. You can see. So recombination, uh, the recombination process in some sense ends here, but the visibility function, where, which is important for the anisotropies, is peaking at later times. Yeah. All right, so why uh, is this so crucial? Well, uncertainties in this free electron fraction, this uh, function as, of, of the free electrons as a function of redshift, any uncertainty will propagate into the CMP power spectra. Yeah. And today, and also in the future, we're knowing these power spectra, we can measure them so precisely that you need to actually worry about small corrections to, these, uh, to this uh, ionization history. And we're talking about sub-percent precision in the parameters nowadays, and in the future anyways. Uh, that means you need to know this ionization history, in particular around the maximum of the visibility function, to 0.1% or better. So that means, uh, as you can understand, when you want to do some physics at the level of 1%, 0.1%, go even one order of magnitude lower, every time you add another order of magnitude in precision, you open up a lot of uh, different physical processes which you have to include. And uh, I think one of the, uh, let me just highlight immediately, uh, the, in particular, our inference on uh, inflation models and early universe models, what set these, uh, the power spectra, the NS um, and also the bion density, those are the parameters which are actually most affected by uncertainties in the recombination process. And uh, here's a nice quote from Douglas Scott. If you want to get 10 to the 16 GeV physics right, um, uh, you better get the EV physics right, uh, which is you know, defining this last scattering surface. OK, so how does recombination work? Uh, so first of all, it's, it's basically a problem of uh, you have some atomic species, and because we're, we're only concerned mainly with hydrogen and helium, there's of course light elements as well, but you can forget about them. So hydrogen and helium are nuclei and electrons, they're in this free bath before recombination, and then as I said, the universe expands and these things recombine. Right? And uh, the most important thing is uh, that the electrons and, and the hydrogen atoms and helium atoms, they can of course be in excited states. So it's not just, you know, you put an electron and a proton together and then you have a hydrogen atom. No, this hydrogen atom has levels and you have to follow those levels. Uh, and then in addition, because of the, um, whenever you have a recombination, you create a photon and in the high frequency part of the CMB black body, uh, these photons from the Lyman alpha and, and uh, uh, the Lyman series photons, they are actually very energetic and they are exceeding the uh, flux from the CMB black body in the background, which means that you have to follow a radiative transfer problem as well. So um, if you look at, uh, at the problem, you basically are looking at the free electron fraction. Uh, sorry that the red is not coming out so well. I hope it's not going to be too bad. Um, the free electron fraction, the temperature of the electrons, uh, and, and, and for that matter, the bions, because they are coupled tightly. Um, you have to follow the protons and uh, any other, you know, high helium, double ionized, single ionized helium, and, um, and then, of course, the uh, um, background radiation field, in particular, the distortion with respect to the CMB black body. So the, the cool thing is, or the, simple, the nice thing is, that this is only a problem of time, really, because we're not talking about any spatial fluctuations. So here's, here's another list, and I, th I think I said a few of those things already, uh, a list of physical conditions which are relevant to this problem. So anisotropies are, uh, for the recombination problem, at least uh, at this, for, for our questions, uh, they are not important. So you can treat the medium as average medium. Yeah, you're not interested in fluctuations. For example, for reionization, this is uh, something which you're worried about or interested in because you want to know patchy reionization. These are the kind of things, and you will probably hear about this. 
Uh, the CMB temperature is very, very, uh, we know it very well because uh, of Kobe virus, and it's just given by this 1 plus Z. Uh, this is just a standard CMB black body. So that defines how many photons you have in every volume element uh, at any time. And uh, the baryon number is very small compared to the photon number. That's one of the key things about recombination, and in fact also for BBN, because photons, they are really strongly dictating what the, uh, what the baryons do. They are basically... Um, if the photons are really ruling uh, what, is, what is happening uh, in the medium, and the bionic physics is, uh, in this sense, uh, subdominant. So this is uh, a meaning that uh, even the small number of photons in the vein tail of the black body can keep uh, the medium ionized, and in particular ionized much longer than you would naively expect from just uh, equating temperatures uh, um, and uh, ionization potential. And then... Collisional processes, uh, again, uh, number density of, uh, of, um, of particles around recombination at redshift 1000 is only 300 per cubic centimeter. Um, this, this means that collisional processes uh, are very uh, subdominant, and I will show you some figures which illustrate this as well, because of course people wanted to make sure that this works, and so it was checked, but it is a very small correction. And everything is dominated by radiative, radiative processes. So you get the excitation of atoms by the uh, black body photons. You get even the de-excitation. You have stimulated effects, which you have to take into account. All these things are very crucial. And one additional very important point, uh, until very late times, the electron temperature, photon temperature, and, and uh, baryon temperature, or proton temperature, and uh, just the, the matter temperature, they are all the same because of Comptonization. Yeah. But you, take, uh, you, have, you write down some evolution equation for the temperature as well, so at the redshifts below 200, you start seeing uh, how the uh, bions and, and photon temperature depart from each other. All right, and um, here's a very simple sketch of you know, Saha uh, recombination, which um, uh, was actually initially used also by Gamow and, and Rashid's uh, very early uh, th uh, thoughts about recombination and the relevance for the CMB anisotropies were also starting with this, uh, with this idea. So just assuming equilibrium recombination, and uh, this is just for hydrogen, and the free electron fraction uh, is, of course, unity, right? Because everything is ionized. And then it drops very, very sharply, uh, exponentially sh uh, strongly. And uh, recombination, if you just define it where one half, uh, where the electron fraction is one half, you would be talking about recombination at uh, 1300 or something. Yeah? Um, and, of course, the 1s population, which is the proxy for the hydrogen, uh, neutral hydrogen fraction, um, just goes up e equally. Um, when you do the calculation, it turns out that the recombination process is very strongly delayed. Uh, this is just uh, the result from uh, the RECFAST calculation. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this delay we will understand in a bit, but it means really that recombination is pushed uh, quite a bit uh, into the, uh, you know, at later times. And in, fact, in particular, there is a residual free electron fraction, right? Here, you really go exponentially low and you have at some point you can not talk about electrons anymore, free electrons, they're all gone. But in reality, because of the uh, timescales of recombination and the expansion timescale, at some point the medium is so dilute that you cannot really uh, capture any electrons and you freeze out. It's just the same as when you freeze out, for example, particle uh, number and so on. Okay, so here's a simple model of the hydrogen atom, uh, just assuming uh, three levels, ground state, 2s state, 2p state. And here's the continuum with electrons and protons, right? So how do you get to the ground state? Well, the first thing you would think about, everybody would think about, well, let's just directly recombine to the ground state, right? The problem is that photon, uh, the photon which is uh, emitted in the Lyman continuum in that interaction, will just be immediately absorbed uh, by, a, uh, by a neighboring neutral hydrogen atom. So you reverse, on average, in, if you will, in the universe, you reverse that process extremely quickly after a very short distance. You know, the photon just travels uh, a very short distance, very short time, and just uh, excites or actually ionizes an atom. So you can, in principle, and uh, it has been estimated, this correction of taking this into account is less than 10 to minus 6 in the free electron fraction calculation. You can completely neglect this. Yeah. So then the next route everybody would immediately think about is going from the uh, continuum to the 2p state and then decaying with the Lyman-alpha transition uh, to the ground state, right? 
Um, here again, uh, another, a similar process happens. The, uh, the photon which is emitted in the resonance will meet another re resonance of a neighboring atom and will just be bouncing up and down very, very many times. And uh, because of the slowness of, uh, of redshifting, it will not be able to um, get out of the resonance quickly enough. Uh, so this process is very strongly suppressed again. And I will try to uh, give a short derivation of how this works. Uh, what we normally use is the Sobel approximation for this escape problem. And that defines the uh, effective transition rate um, of the 2s, uh, excuse me, 2p to a ground state transition, and it's suppressed by something like seven orders of magnitude, which means uh, normally the transition is something like six times 10 to the eight transitions per second, and in reality it's of order 10 in, during recombination. Yeah, so huge suppression just because these photons are stuck in the resonance. So uh, that makes another process, which you normally forget about, uh, uh, quite important, which is the 2s decay, uh, 2 photon decay of the 2s level. And I will talk about that as well a little bit more. Uh, but these photons, which are emitted, that's two photons. Of course, it's not allowed. A dipole transition, um, one photon dipole tra transition is not allowed. Uh, but two photons is OK. And uh, these photons, they, uh, the, the rate at which this decay happens is something like 8.2 per second. So similar order of magnitude uh, when you take into account the suppression of the Lyman alpha transfer. Um, and that means that in, pre in, act in reality, uh, all hydrogen atoms that became neutral, um, they mostly became neutral through this uh, low probability transition, the second order perturbation, uh, I mean, in quantum mechanical transition. So it's quite interesting, uh, but both of them, of course, play a crucial role, and you have to treat the problem of both of them uh, nicely. So um, this is uh, something, when you think about this picture, uh, you get uh, something like 10 20% precision uh, and, um, in, in the calculation and in the result of uh, what, what, uh, um, what the ionization history looks like. And, of course, this was done very long ago already, in the uh, late 60s, and in particular, um, the group uh, around uh, Jakob Seldorovich and Rashid, you see here, uh, they were, were the ones really pioneering this, uh, this idea and, and figuring out that you have to include the two photon decay of the uh, 2S level. And um, the story is, uh, if, if, if Rashid will correct me if I tell it wrong, that of course, that uh, they worked out these, uh, these ideas and the papers took quite a while to really get out, in particular to appear in the West. Um, and Schlossky, who is a, a, a um, radio astronomer, he's also well, uh, well known in connection with uh, synchrotron uh, radiation. Um, he was the only one from the Moscow group really able to travel to the West. And so he was uh, basically giving a talk about this. And then, of course, people uh, heard this talk and he also understood the problem and was able to independently, you know, uh, find the picture as well. But the ideas are certainly coming from uh, Moscow. All right. Uh, yeah, let's see if I can get a very simple derivation of the of the equations for the uh, uh, because uh, in the third lecture we will talk about RecFast and RecFast plus plus. Let me just give a very brief derivation of the three-level uh, atom uh, case. If I go here, that's okay, right? So um, again, let's start with you know continuum where you have electrons and, and protons. So let's forget about any helium uh, atoms right now. And let's think about, uh, the, uh, the, again, the 2s, 2p level, and uh, the 1s level. Now, the first simplification you do is you don't really separate these two levels, the 2s and the 2p. You just treat them as one level. So let's call them, OK, let's, let's not. Let's just call them one level. Let's call them two. And this one, you call them one. So you don't treat the angular momentum substates, but you just uh, summarize both of them. Yeah? Then, of course, you can define a population of the, of the level two and a population of the level one, ground state population. And then you can ask the question, well, uh, what is the transition rates between them? Right? Just here, the transition, you know that this is the two photon transition and it's also the uh, two, uh, the Lyman alpha transition, but let's just call this one transition rate. Then if you want to write down how many um, electrons uh, arrive in the ground state, then of course this is something like, let me just write total transition rate um, to the ground state from the second uh, level. 
and it's of course multiplied by the population of the second level. And then, um, well, a very simple trick is if you want to have equilibrium, you, you, of course you know that everything is, should be proportional to the ground state. Uh, the transition rate is again the same, um, 2, 1 times the uh, ground state. And then you have to add here a factor, H new transition, KT. Um, which, which just ensures that when you're in Boltzmann equilibrium, the upper level is just Boltzmann suppressed versus the lower level, then you will see immediately that this uh, is in equilibrium and you don't have any net transitions. Right? So that's a simple way of writing this, and I'm going to uh, define this Um, X quantity, and, and you saw it, uh, I think, several times as well, uh, just as this, you know, dimensionless frequency, uh, basically relative to the photon temperature. All right, so um, now let's try and figure out what this uh, transition rate is. Um, we know that this uh, has a transition rate in vacuum of order 6 times 10 to the 8 per second, and we already said this is 8.2 per second. Let's call this a to gamma. Am I writing too small, or is it is it halfway okay? Hmm? I will. I will. Let me wait. Okay. Yes. Uh, good. So uh, these transition rates are in vacuum, and the two photon decay rate is indeed a vacuum quantity. You don't need to worry about it at least now in this picture. So we know that there will be in the contribution to a uh, to the uh, total there will be the to photon contribution, right? And then, um, if you naively think about this as the vacuum rate, then you know, because the statistical weight of the second shell, uh, the, the P level is three times larger than the um, uh, S, uh, S level, you will have three times A to one, uh, to one, yeah? So that would be the vacuum decay rates. But, and I'm going to explain how to modify this, but I'm just going to immediately say, we, we call this A star because it's actually an effective uh, transition rate, which, as I told you, is very, very strongly suppressed. So this is the decay rate of the level. That's great. So now we need to write down the uh, um, rate equation for the second shell. And that's just going to be... Uh, you know that the electrons and the protons, they recombine. So they increase, of course, the population of the 2s uh, of, the, um, of the second shell. So you have the protons colliding with an electron, and then you just put here the recombination rate. Uh, again, this is an effective quantity. You can, in principle, think of it as a sum of the 2s and 2p uh, recombination rate, but you can, in principle, take the higher levels into account as well. So let's just call this a recombination rate. Yeah. And then, of course, the inverse process should be there. So that's just going to be uh, N2, uh, N2, the second shell, multiplied by the, the custom Mary thing is to just write uh, beta, which is the uh, fortunization rate. So that's just how things enter from the continuum. But of course, there's the exit as well to the ground state. So you uh, subtract here the, um, excuse me, the transition rate for, uh, to the ground state as well, because of course, uh, if you decay to the ground state, you have the negative increase of the uh, of the ground state um, rate. Right, and then uh, the first assumption is um, that uh, this here can be roughly set to zero. So you're in quasi-stationary evolution, which means the level populations don't change much over time scales of uh, of uh, per Hubble, basically. And if you then just solve this equation, you find that the um, quasi-stationary solution, let me write QS, um, is just given, I just don't want to mess up here, is just given by um, alpha 2 n e n p plus the total decay rate to the, uh, from the second to the first level uh, multiplied by the ground state uh, population and then, of course, this uh, exponential suppression factor here. Yes? Uh, sorry, uh, here? Yes. Yeah. 
So um, uh, you can you can realize because you know that in Boltzmann equilibrium, uh, this this is nothing else than Boltzmann suppressed, right? And uh, you're maybe thinking about the Einstein coefficients B and A and B, but this is super confusing and it's not necessary. You just uh, basically uh, can, can think about this as this is, in fact, nothing else than the um, average occupation number of photons. Yeah? And because you're having the excitation, it's nothing else than a photon colliding with a, with a ground state electron. So just think about it that way. All right, uh, so the quasi stationary solution, which I haven't spelled out fully yet, is then just given by um, plus beta 2. All right, so that's uh, the quasi stationary solution. And if you uh, just put that back into the rate equation, well, it's, it's not too illuminating to just spell it out, but I will just write the solution n1 dt is then given by so um, this is an overall factor just if you massage the equations and then um, it's nothing else than um, ne and p alpha 2 so it's basically the net flow of electrons um, from the Um, uh, from the continuum, that's how, how, how the electrons enter the, uh, the hydrogen atom, and they can exit through this, uh, through this uh, rate. So this is the rate equation, which you will see if you look at the RECFAST uh, papers, uh, which are, are even the original Peebles and, and Sunyaev papers. This is basically the net rate equation which you need to solve. And then you add, of course, helium, and you add a temperature for the electrons, and you're done. It's three equations, and you can, in principle, uh, at least at a level of 10% or so, you can already solve the problem. And one of the important factors, which uh, people refer to as the inhibition factor, um, I think it's C in, in people's papers, um, this is basically uh, uh, modulating the efficiency of this recombination process. So this factor can depart from unity, uh, in particular, when uh, photonization is strong and it becomes close to unity at late times. Yeah? So that's the rate equation, which is really quite important for uh, solving the recombination problem. And in fact, uh, even approximate schemes which, modul uh, which modify uh, these calculations and include corrections, they basically base this uh, on these equations as well. Yes? Sorry? This is just the photonization process from the second level. So think of it as the beta 2 is something like a weighted average. In fact, it's just beta 1, uh, sorry, 2s plus beta uh, 2p. So maybe, maybe just because I, I didn't actually highlight it again, but we should have in, in principle added here a recombination to the ground state as well. But I told you, let's just leave it away. So that's why there's no term like that here. But here you have the recombination. To these two P levels and to S levels, so so that's that's where this comes from. And you can calculate these uh, uh, these rates by by just you you, ne you need the photonization cross section and you uh, convolve that with the or uh, average uh, this with the CMB black body and you just can calculate these uh, recombination and photonization rates in that way. All right. Uh, Let's see. I think, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you, you, you can, in principle, uh, collisions are completely neglected here. And some people uh, in the 70s, in fact, tried to argue that collisions are really important, which is not correct. But um, you can just add them as well. So, yeah. It's, yeah, you, you, can just, uh, you will just have a different rate coefficient, and the rate coefficient will depend, for example, on the uh, projectiles like electrons and protons which are hitting the atom. All right, 
So now we all understand the principle of this recombination equations. And uh, as I said, it's really important to notice that the net rate is strongly suppressed uh, by, by, these, uh, by this inhibition factor. And that you're, although you're trying to recombine to the ground state, you're not directly recombining to the ground state, but it looks more like uh, an equation where, you know, here the 2s level was replaced by the 1s level, if you will, but modulated by this additional coefficient, which basically is nothing else than um, the Boltzmann equilibrium uh, um, uh, 2s level. Yeah, uh, sorry, two, uh, second shell uh, um, uh, population. Yeah. All right. So if you do these calculations with basing this on on these uh, on uh, on these equations, uh, then you would get the so-called effective three-level atom, which is the solid black line here. So I'm I'm going now to the uh, basis for the rec fast calculation, where uh, the big extension was that they didn't um, anymore just use three levels, but they actually tried to include many shells and many levels. So hydrogen was treated with 300 levels, but no angular momentum substates. I will come to that. Um, Helium was also added by 200 level, with 200 levels, and um, the double ionized helium with 100 levels. Uh, sorry, um, single ionized helium with 100 levels. And then there was even some inclusion of some low redshift chemistry. And then the calculation is done. And as a function of how many shells you include, you can see how the recombination S3 changes. Yeah? So this is uh, a multi level calculation, which was the basis for RecFast. And RecFast then used these calculations to basically uh, modify these uh, simple equations uh, and just um, correct them with, with a so called fudge function to basically mimic the 300 level calculation. Yeah? So that's, that's already the guts of RecFast solving a helium equation, a hydrogen equation in this form and a temperature equation, uh, which I didn't derive, but uh, we will see uh, um, in the third lecture briefly, and then just uh, fudging it so that you can actually match the real uh, full solution, which, are there, there, uh, in there, um, which was obtained with this multi-level atom uh, calculation. However, it turns out, although, of course, the numerical precision was very high, the accuracy was only uh, one to three percent, because physics was missing, right? And I told you already, Simbiana copies, they are actually sensitive to physics uh, or corrections at a level of 0.1% in principle. Yeah, so, so um, the effective three-level atom, um, I told you that here you can think of this as, you know, recombination rate to the 2S level and 2P level, but the effective three-level atom takes the other levels in there into account and says, oh, they are all in Boltzmann equilibrium with the second shell, and every e electron that enters into, let's say, the tenth shell can actually be added to the second shell with some effective coefficient. So that's the effective three-level atom, which uh, Peebles, in fact, um, was, was, was also uh, using. No, uh, this is... This is um, uh, uh, if effective three-level um, uh, is, is, as I said, is just basically a modification of these recombination rates. Yeah. So, uh, but remember, here one equation describes a, a total shell, but you actually have to worry about all the substates, which I will also explain in a second. Right. Um, so uh, this is the basis which was actually used in in the uh, you know pre-Planck um, uh, observations era. WMAP was using these calculations, and uh, they have been accurate enough at that point. But now uh, Planck came along, and then level the target was 0.1 percent, and that's when things become complicated. Uh, although. Um, I won't have time to go through all of them. I will try to highlight a few, give you a flavor. It's all standard physics. It's all radiative transfer done precisely and uh, calculation of atomic physics precisely. There's no new physics in this calculation. It's all standard textbooks, if you will, although some of the extensions you have to actually add uh, in order to describe the problem at this level uh, are not, of course, textbook, uh, standard textbook. So uh, obviously, with a list like this, this can't be done by just one person. There was lots of people involved in this and uh, 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 helping to solve this problem. This is a picture which was taken in 2008, which was a meeting um, which I also organized, uh, helped organizing in Orsay, 
uh, which was specifically targeting, let's get ready for the analysis of Planck. And there's uh, many people here, Rashid, you see, this is Viktor Dubrovic. Um, uh, he, he played also a crucial role in, in recombination, in particular for the recombination radiation. Um, uh, and everybody's wanting to know who this is. This is Savili Kaschenboim. Uh, he's, he's a great quantum, uh, um, he, he knows a lot of things about quantum electrodynamics and quantum physics. So uh, I was actually consulting a lot with him. And uh, here's Yassin, Ali Amut, Chris Hirata, uh, Dan Grin, uh, Jose Alberto Rubino Martin, uh, Douglas Scott, of course, uh, one of the pioneers of these fast calculations, and uh, um, um, Jeffrey Fong and uh, Kulubchenko and uh, uh, several people have really contributed to this. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about the real challenges. So the first challenge is just an atomic physics challenge. Uh, the fact that uh, um, uh, the the computations scale with n square. When you really do the full calculation, you can no longer just add one equation per level, but you have to actually basically you're, it blows up by like n square. But uh, on the good side. Hydrogen atom is very simple, and hydrogenic helium, so uh, W ionized helium or single ionized helium recombination, is, is simple because we have analytic formulae, and you have learned these in your quantum mechanics lectures, of course, uh, for um, you know, recombination coefficients or recombination uh, cross sections, proteinization cross sections, transition rates, all analytic functions. Now, saying that is, of course, they are hypergeometric functions. I don't want to bore you with it, but calculating them actually for very high levels, so level 500 or so, took actually quite some effort because you need to be very careful with uh, evaluating these functions. Yeah. Um, there's also two photon decay rates which are relevant from the higher levels, and you can calculate them analytically, and collision rates uh, are available, but they are imprecise. Luckily, they are not so important, and uh, improvements uh, of these rates uh, didn't really lead any uh, big uh, changes. So the big challenge is n-square scaling. Yeah? For neutral helium, uh, which is the second most, of course, relevant uh, part, because the visibility function is around redshift 1,000, and helium is just a little bit before that, right? Neutral helium is 2,000. So the tail of the visibility in the early times is affected by it, but it doesn't have an, as high impact, of course, as hydrogen. And doubly ionized helium, uh, or recombination of uh, singly ionized helium at redshift 6,000 is not so important. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Again, uh, here we have another challenge because uh, the lower levels, they are, uh, are non-hydrogenic because you have a three-body problem. You have both electrons and you need to worry about the spins uh, of the electrons, how they are oriented. So you have singlet and triplet uh, states and um, the calculation for these rates is actually not that exact. So, of course, there's coefficients which you can find, but they're not as precise. Yeah. Um, they have been improved in 2007 because of the re relevance to recombination uh, in the universe, in fact, by Drake and Morton. And uh, these uh, new rate coefficients are, of course, used in the calculations. Uh, and here's just uh, for everybody uh, a, a Grotrian diagram showing the complicated spectrum of, of helium, um, where, of course, you have to worry about singlet and triplet states. Uh, usually, everybody thinks of tri triplet atoms and singlet atoms independently because there's no real strong transitions between them, but there is so-called spin for Britain transitions, um, which you actually have to take into account, and then the recombination problem, they are relevant. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the helium problem uh, is a little bit more complicated than the hydrogen problem because you have fine structure and everything. Yeah. You need to worry about those things. So. Uh, the computational challenge is, is a little bit more demanding in principle, but it's luckily not affecting the whole recombination calculation as much by as much, so you're, you're getting away with less work. All right, so let's talk about uh, one uh, um, uh, uh, correction that, uh, that people had uh, not thought about, but leads to some uh, departure or change in the ionization history at the level of 1%. And this is coming from the stimulated two-photon decay. So stimulated emission, you all know, right? You have an excited state, the 2S state, and then there's a photon passing by, and that photon will stimulate the emission of, of, a, of a photon. This is here for a dipole transition, so just Lyman alpha, let's say, or a higher level, because the population of photons in the Lyman alpha line is very low, so occupation number is very small. You don't need to worry there. But for the two-photon decay, a similar process happens. Yeah? And this means that this vacuum decay rate, which is just basically given by the integral of the decay profile. So for Lyman alpha resonance, you know that the profile is a Lorentzian, and when you convolve it with the, with the motions, you get a, a Fock profile. 
I will show that in a, in a bit as well. But for the two-photon decay, you basically have a maximum probability of emitting a photon at half of the Lyman alpha uh, energy. Yeah? Naturally, because you're splitting basically both uh, equally the energy of the photons. Right? Um, so if you take this integral over of this profile, then you get this uh, uh, 8.22. 2, yeah? But because of the presence of CMB photons at very low frequencies, because if you know that there's a photon uh, emitted here, or close to the Lyman alpha line, then due to energy conservation, you know that the other photon had to be emitted at very low frequencies. But the CMB black body occupation number uh, increases very strongly at those low frequencies. Uh, you know that the occupation number uh, goes like e to the x minus 1. And then at low frequencies, this is of course nothing else than 1 over x. And 1 over x, when x becomes small, uh, becomes large. So if you then multiply this two-photon two decay profile with the corresponding occupation number enhancement due to Bose bunching, you can then do the integrated rate uh, of decay just by taking into account the black body photons. And then this rate is enhanced and leads to a correction and an acceleration of recombination uh, by something like 1.3%. Rashid was very unhappy with me because I only included that effect, because of course there's the inverse process as well, um, which Kulubchenko and uh, collaborators actually took into account. You can have the Lyman alpha photons or the two photon uh, uh, photons, of course, feed back onto the um, transition and re excite the atom, right, by the combination of two photons. And this effectively uh, leads to a reversal of this process and cancels some of the decay. Now, the, uh, the net effect is still an enhancement of the rate, uh, so uh, at least we were only a factor of two in this picture wrong, uh, but uh, it, is, it is at the end uh, leading to an acceleration of recombination. Uh, th this is, a, this is the... Um, <coughs> uh, so uh, it delays recombination and the uh, net effect is 0.6% uh, is uh, um, uh, around, uh, um, around uh, recombination. Right, so uh, that, that is one, uh, one very fundamental process in terms of the uh, uh, recombination um, acceleration. But uh, one of the other channels, as I told you, the two-photon decay is one of them. 60% of atoms make it through that, but the Lyman alpha transition is the second. And I hand-waved here by saying there's an effective rate. Um, so now let's try to understand uh, this effective rate. So I want to show you first a movie of the, uh, the radiative transfer solution for this. Oh, um, <clears throat> it's a... Yeah. Um, so, uh, in fact, we have never estimated just from this process how, how much it, but, but you, you, can, you can in principle, and I will show some figures of the total effect uh, later, when you have a 1% uh, correction to the ionization history at, redshift of, uh, of, uh, at the last scattering surface, 1100, this translates into roughly a 1% order, 1% correction to the CLs as well. And that means when you have the wrong shape of the CLs or, you know, uh, corrections to it, it biases the parameters. So, yeah, this is really an important point, and I will get back to that, obviously, later and try to explain more. Yeah. No, no. Um, so, so, you have been looking at this movie now for a while. Uh, it's basically starting at very high redshifts. Um, well, very high. I think it was redshift uh, 2000 or something like that. Um, initially, no distortion. No, no recombination has happened yet, so you don't have any uh, Lyman alpha photons, uh, Lyman beta uh, or gamma photons. But then, of course, as the process of recombination happens, you get these photons being created. And here you can think of this, so this is a movie as a function of redshift, and it's all relative to the, whoops, relative to the um, uh, Lyman alpha line in terms of energy, and here's basically the distortion which you have, right? So think of it as a typewriter. There's a, photons being injected, effectively injected, and then redshifting takes them away. That's why you get, you know, the amount of photons which are being injected here, they just 
vary over time, and redshifting takes them out of the line, and then you get basically like a typewritten history of the recombination process, if you will. And of course, so this includes all the physics, and then we'll go through it a little bit now. Of course, there's things like Lyman beta feeding back onto Lyman alpha. There's Lyman gamma feeding back onto Lyman uh, beta, and so on. And there's all these interactions which you have to take into account. Yeah. So how does this work? Uh, because this calculation is in fact done in Cosmorec uh, in time, and it doesn't take a long, uh, long time now. It's, it's, it's just taking one second uh, to evaluate this recombination uh, history. So this is uh, way slower than in, in Cosmorec, but it's just illustrating how these lines become active and inactive. All right, so uh, I, um, let's go to the Sobolev approximation for the recombination process. <clears throat> which is one of the crucial aspects, and it's also some of the, uh, one of the places where we have worked very hard to improve it. Uh, at the end, we were quite sad because the correction is not that large, although the physics, as I will try to explain, of the Sobolev approximation, in fact, is not really that applicable to this recombination problem. I hope I will convince you about that. So, you have the problem, there's an electron here in the, in, the, uh, in the ground state or in the upper state, and it just emits a Lyman alpha photon and gets ex excited and de-excited, and you have this uh, up, down, up, down, right? And uh, because of redshifting, the photon slowly drifts out of the resonance to the red wing. Yeah? So when you say actually escape probability, you mean how many photons reach to the red side of the line without interacting anymore or without exciting, uh, supporting the 2P level. 2P level. So when you're in the blue wing, you will at some point redshift into the line and then play this game, and then you will escape from the line. So normally when you do spatial uh, problems, you think of escape as leaving the medium, right? Here it's leaving the resonance. Yeah, this is just one crucial point which I want to highlight. And the main assumptions, and we will come back to that, uh, of the Sobolev approximation is that the population and the radiation field are both quasi-stationary. You don't need to worry about, it's all instantaneous solutions, all quasi-stationary solutions. Yeah? Then every scattering uh, leads to a complete redistribution over the line profile. Now, what does that mean? Um, when you are in the 2P level and you don't go to the ground state, we will think immediately about a folk profile or a, a Lorentzian. So here I'm, I'm plotting basically the emission profile, similar to the 2S to photon decay, where it was this broad spectrum. This is now the resonance spectrum, and the red line is the Lorentzian, just coming from standard quantum mechanics. And when you uh, take the motions of the atoms into account, then you have this broadened folked uh, profile, which is here having the Doppler core and here the Lorentzian wings. So this is all plotted in form of the Doppler, uh, uh, Doppler width, which is just giving you an, an estimate for how strongly uh, things are basically Doppler boosted. Yeah? So you're in, this, you're in this line, and you, when, you are, when you're from the 2P level decaying to the ground state, you will have the emission of this profile. Yeah? Now, the absorption process, you assume, has exactly the same profile, which means if you're a photon here, you have a very low probability of being absorbed, and if you're a photon here, you have uh, equally low uh, probability, and here in the center, you have a very large probability. It turns out that assumption is not completely correct, particularly in the damping wings, so far away from the resonance, and I will try to get at that. But that's the, one of the key assumptions, complete redistribution, and it basically means that even if you have excess energy, here, because when you excite here with a uh, super Lyman alpha photon, that something reshuffles the phases and makes you, uh, you know, basically uh, emit again in, in the uh, Lorentzian profile, although you had excess energy. And similarly, if you're here at low frequencies, you get excited, you cannot really reach the 2P two, uh, two level, but something helps you to reshuffle it in some sense. That's, that's what the picture is behind this. And then... Uh, um, uh, uh, the emission and absorption profiles have the same shape. I already uh, said that, and, and the complete distribution is, is, is this, you know, process of reshuffling phases. Um, I hope I was clear about this. Um, so when you do this calculation, you get the Sobolev approximation for the escape probability. And um, I don't know how I'm doing with time. I'm, I'm probably up with time, Ethan. Right? Um, no. How, how much? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, uh, well, so uh, I think I will not go through the Sobolev approximation, but just give you uh, a flavor of how this, how this works. So if you, if you do the radiative transfer problem, just assuming that you're emitting a photon in some, in some band. So here I'm saying, let's inject the photon in the line center, 
And then let's calculate the scattering of these photons and the emission and absorption, in fact, only the absorption of the photons, right? So then initially, the photon is just, here's my delta function or my, um, you know, uh, Doppler core. And then as time goes by, uh, you get broadening of the line. It's just this motion of photons into the wings of the line. Uh, so tau is basically a time coordinate. And I'm talking about redshift of 1,400, so rather high redshifts. Yeah. And then as time goes by, you see that the broadening becomes bigger and you get this, you know, as I said, uh, uh, drifting into the wings very symmetrically, but there is a net drift into the red wing. And that red drift is coming from the red shifting of the medium, uh, of the expansion, and you're basically asking the question, how many photons really arrive, how many can I count at the, at the uh, very red side of the, of the line? Yeah? And if you do this uh, with the line center, then uh, you can see that only a small fraction of photons uh, really reappears. Yeah? They, they really escape. If you go to, for example, the red wing, uh, so you're injecting at 10 Doppler widths away, so that's not dramatically far from the, from the resonance, but it's already in the red wing. You can see now this has increased by, um, if you compare, this is 10 to minus 5 here, this level, and here it has already increased to uh, 1%. So escaping from the red side, you're doing already, you're basically out of the resonance, so you can escape quickly. Yeah? Uh, when you do this from the blue side, you see that the photon, uh, which is injected at the blue side, will then have to travel through the resonance, which is bad news for the uh, photon, because it basically gets destroyed with a very high probability. And in fact, the probability of arriving on the red side um, is basically the same as if you're injecting in the line center. And if you now plot as a function of this injection frequency, uh, the net um, escape. How many photons did I, did I count? As I said, we can ignore the break, right? Um, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, when you do this from the Doppler, Doppler core or the blue side of the line, you see that the, at this redshift, um, the fraction of photons which really escape is very small, 10 to minus 5. And um, at the, uh, on the red side, you get a, a much more large uh, escape probability. And um, uh, this, of course, escape probability depends on the time because the medium, the density of the medium uh, changes, the Hubble expansion rate changes. Uh, and it also depends on the physics that you include. Here's uh, uh, different cases, so two different redshifts, and then also where you don't include actually scattering physics. And the escape probability will be modulated by these uh, kind of aspects. So um, uh, th that, that's, that's a rough sketch of what you have to think about when you do the calculation. It's like a Green's function of the problem where you just say, I inject a photon, I ask how many photons are arriving, and I write down the probability, and you can find a solution which, was, uh, which is uh, given by this expression here. And you can see this optical depth, uh, which is just related to transition rates in the, uh, in the uh, Lyman alpha line. This um, uh, optical depth is very, very large. So you can basically approximate the escape probability as 1 over tau s, uh, the Sobolev escape probability. Yeah? And that means that the uh, 6 times 10 to the 8 transitions get uh, suppressed by you know, uh, 8 orders of magnitudes, 7 orders of magnitudes, which means the two-photon decay rate becomes really, really crucial for the whole dynamics. All right, um, let's talk about some problems with this. Um, the, uh, if, <clears throat> if I just in the quasi-stationary uh, solution, I've shown you the movie, right? And you have seen there's lots of you know, uh, changes in the shape of the lines and everything. But in the quasi-stationary solution, the spectrum which you would get looks nothing like this, uh, nothing else like this. Just here's the Lyman alpha resonance. Yeah? Lyman alpha would be looking flat escape down to very low frequencies, no time dependence, no nothing and it would be having this kind of shape at very high frequencies. Now, one of the big problems is that the Sobolev approximation it was really developed for expanding, uh, expanding media, envelopes of stars, and the optical depths which were encountered there were certainly not 10 to the 8. Because 10 to the 8 is a huge optical depth, and it brings you, uh, in terms of the solution, where the variation of the solution happens, brings you into something like 10,000, uh, uh, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 Doppler widths away from the core. Because you're so optically thick, the line center couples very, very strongly uh, away from the center. So the Sobolev approximation would look like this. This would be the solution. And, and this here is even exceeding the continuum level, uh, the continuum uh, energy. 
So it's as if you're coupling every level, every the photon field to the line center up to the continuum, which is really completely physic unphysical, right, for the situation we are applying it to. So that's one of the biggest problems with the solution. And in fact, if you have, if you completely neglect scattering, you can get a very a much better solution, which is much more close to the real solution um, uh, in terms of the physical application. So that's one problem. And then, of course, the next problem is time dependence, because this is the spectrum you would predict at very, very large distances in the, in the, uh, in the red wing. But the real spectrum, as you know, uh, has, has some real time dependence, right? There's all these, all these uh, you can see how the typewriting, how the time dependence of how the ejection rate changed is reflected in the red wing uh, distortion. Right? So that's actually the biggest correction to the problem, and it turns out uh, that this, um, because you really need to know uh, the uh, spectrum, even to something like 10 to the 4 Doppler width, if you want to have 0.1% precision, you really need to take into account this uh, time dependence. In the core, it is okay. In the Doppler core, everything is extremely rapid and in equilibrium very quickly, but in the wings, it's not correct. And then uh, there's also this problem with the emission and absorption profile. Uh, complete distribution and things like that are not working, and emission and absorption are not equally probable on the red side and on the blue side. And you can think about it this way. If you plot the CMB black body spectrum as a function of frequency, and you're now here in the Lyman alpha line, then if you have an absorption of a photon on this side, yeah, if it really, if it really would be a real absorption, uh, and it goes to the continuum, then you need a higher, uh, a low energy Balmer, Balmer continuum photon to really uh, make this go to the continuum. Whereas when you do this here, you don't need as much energy extra. Uh, you need a little bit more energy extra. Excuse me, right? So let me just sketch it this way: the one S goes to the two P. And if you want to go to the continuum, you need another photon, right? And this is a Balmer, um, a Balmer continuum photon, H H H HC. And that photon, if you're on the red side, needs to be more energetic. So it's picked from, if you have here the uh, Balmer continuum, it's picked from this side when you're on this side. And when you're here on this side, then you're picking a photon from the low frequency side, and that means you're modulating the uh, probability of uh, really having this uh, process. Uh, this naturally comes into the game when you really do two photon process and really treat it as a two photon process, but uh, I don't want to go into more details here. So, if you then uh, take all those uh, things into account that I talked about, time dependence and, and uh, uh, here's uh, frequency distribution and so on, you get the escape probability. Uh, relative to the standard escape probability is changed by a level of 12%, but it's happening at rather high redshifts, redshift 1,300. And unfortunately, at those redshifts, the escape problem in Lyman alpha is not as important. So when you then do the calculation of the ionization history changes relative to the standard drag fast calculation, you see that the net effect, which is the uh, solid black line, is actually only 2%. Yeah? So you started with 12%, which would have been really nice, um, but your, the net effect is dominated by these redshifts, where the uh, where you know, and then the importance of Lyman alpha is only half because of uh, the two photon decay being equally important. That means you get roughly ballpark two percent, and it's an acceleration of recombination. So um, that is uh, that is uh, part of the story of the problem. Uh, um, but I hmm. do I have five minutes because then I, I can close the. Uh, our uh, two photon process, and then I think we're uh, we're nearly done. So two photon decays can not only happen from the two S level, but also from three S and and the three D level. You can just take this route independently, of course, and you can get to the ground state. Um, normally, you think of this as two photon uh, independent photons, right? You just say there's one quantum act and another one. But Maria Gabbard Meyer uh, was able to treat this problem um, in her PhD thesis uh, uh, in, in one quantum act. And because collisions are not important, you actually have to do that. Yeah? And you can calculate these transition rates uh, 
rather easily. It's nothing else than just dipole matrix elements between these uh, levels, and you have to take into account con continuum states and so on. It's not complicated in the sense of uh, the, the math behind it, but you have to uh, calculate these things uh, properly to, in order to really calculate what these transition probabilities are, and in particular, how the radiative transfer is affected. Um, so, the two photon lines, uh, line profiles, just like with the 2s to photon decay, they have departures from these standard shapes, which would be the sum of Lorentzians. And that means that the differential probabilities of being appearing as a photon in some part of the spectrum uh, is changed. And if you do the 2s and, th uh, sorry, 3s and 3d two photon profiles, then this is how they look. So here's the 3s decay profile. The Lyman alpha resonance would be. Uh, um, uh, sorry, the yes, Lyman alpha resonance would be here because we are normalizing here now to the total transition frequency, which is the third shell, of course, which is larger than Lyman alpha. Um, and then when you know that one photon is emitted in this resonance, then you know that the other one is a Balmer alpha photon because of energy conservation, right? And if you now look at the shapes and compare this to the Lorentzian, you see that the two photon decay profile of the third shell, uh, 3s, is enhanced on the blue side and it's decreased, it's smaller in the, on, the left, on, the, on the red side. And here in the D states, it's actually the opposite. So the differential contributions of these levels and transitions has to be taken into account, and they change uh, uh, recombination dynamics. For example, here in the red wing, where you know that photons will escape, you have less, fewer photons emitted, which means that you should guess, get a, de uh, a delay of recombination, whereas here you get an enhancement of recombination. And you can do the same for higher levels, becomes very complicated quickly, but uh, we had to go to uh, actually five levels um, to, to do this. Um, and it's, it's, it's something you can calculate uh, um, uh, quasi-analytically uh, um, at the end of the day. In a similar vein, you have a two-photon process connected with Raman scattering, and I know everybody knows about this probably from kindergarten already. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the process for the 2S level. You go to the uh, ground, um, ground state by just having a Balmer alpha uh, absorption from the CMB, and then a, um, a, a Lyman, Lyman beta transition to the ground state. Yeah. And again, differential probabilities of the um, profiles is what matters. And uh, here's a figure just illustrating how the distortion at a given time, this is redshift 1190, just was a random choice, how the spectral distortion looks like. And here's the Lyman alpha line. You remember the movie, of course, but this is a snapshot. And if you now do the reference case, doesn't include any of those two photon decays and Raman scatterings. This would be the uh, black line. It includes some scattering as well. If you now include two photon decays, then you see uh, that um, there is a, a small uh, reduction of the blue wing um, uh, distortion. That means feedback is uh, uh, smaller. That means recombination is, in fact, uh, accelerating a little bit. Whereas here, when you include now Raman scattering, you see that this uh, enhances the blue wing of the Lyman alpha, and that means delay of uh, the recombination rate. And this was um, first actually treated um, by Chris Arata in 2008. Um, uh, we had only looked at the two photon decay profiles, but uh, Chris uh, had also looked at the uh, Raman processes and uh, um, we, we, we later were able to reproduce the results as well. All right, um, and I think I, I will probably stop there because uh, I do have a, a few more things that I wanted to highlight and uh, we will delay that for tomorrow then. Thank you. <clears throat>